Nick Gauntlet, Private Knight, by Austin McKinley. Chapter 7. The iron bars of the jail slam shut. I sit down amongst the sorry rabble of other townsfolk railguards run in on minor infractions. Then the guards shove Galena in through another door. She approaches my cell. Railgar said you wanted to see me. She crosses her arms. Not a good sign. Say they're going to execute me, I tell her. I heard, says she. I hope you got what you came for. I hope it was worth it. She puts my glove, which I'd managed to leave in the dungeon again, on the horizontal bar between us, and looks into my eyes. I wanted to apologize for misleading you, I say. I took advantage, always putting things where they don't belong. I understand, she says. I share some of the blame. I thought maybe there was something you could tell me, I continue, about what happened to Marcus. Galena looks conflicted. Don't want to die with the case unsolved. Somebody should know what happened to him. I press, and I was the closest thing he had to family. You didn't know him, Galena says. Not anymore. You don't have to tell me if it was your mistress, says I. Just nod. Like you said, we're all guilty of something. She grips the bars. This thing is bigger than any of us. She takes a piece of parchment from her robe and rolls a cigarette for me to lick. It takes elements of all kinds, she says. We can't help the bonds that attract us. We don't choose the kind of element we are. We always have a choice, says I. The guards frog march me down a long hallway that opens into the bright castle courtyard. A crowd murmurs unpleasantness beyond. But is it for me, or the Duke? Lady Antimony steps from the shadows inside the archway. Guards, hold him a moment, she says. Come for one last gloat, I ask her. I'll keep my belt on. It'll be like iron sharpening iron. She leans in close, her lips hover over me. I was hurt at first when you said what you did, but I understand now. It's a result of serving with chastity, and we all lash out at the ones we serve. I grab her neck, push her against the wall. The guard's blades hover at my throat. You lied to me from the beginning. I see that her. Not that I didn't know it. You wanted to make sure I didn't upset your situation. Hiring me was just a pretense for keeping me too drunk to do anything about it. Maybe you figured I could pick your lock after. I don't pretend to know everything. You don't understand. Intimony adjusts her skirt. That chastity belt must itch like the devil. For all my gusseted furnishings, I'm a prisoner in this palace. My parents married me off to Clissold. I was 15. He was 50. Can you blame me for wanting to see a little bit of life beyond these walls before I wither? That's not what I blame you for. I release her. It's not too late for you and me, she breathes. I could still speak a word in his ear. What about Galena? I ask. Forget her. Be with me, says the lady. Pass, says I. Fine. She steps back. Have it your way. The guards drag me out into the center of the courtyard. The duke stands from his seat on the balcony. Seated next to him, the bishop and galley of bismuth look on. Silence, roars Ralgar, and the crowd goes quiet. Sir Nicholas of Gloucester, Calamel says, you stand accused of treason, of attempted murder on our person and that of our wife, of the murder of Marcus the blacksmith and the spreading of vicious lies about said murder and for the recent intemperate weather. Well, as long as I'm the scapegoat, at least he does a thorough job. Intimony slips onto the balcony and perches beside the Duke. In the crowd, Warren, the meathead from the tavern, leans over to Cadmia. Good to see the law finally catch up with that villain, I imagine him saying. Sometimes the law and justice are two different things, Cadmia says, if she's paid attention at all. And most grievously, Calamel produces the wanted poster with my picture. The desertion of a holy crusade for which I have just learned you are wanted in your hometown. How do you plead? Never if I can help it, says I. Very well, huffs Calamel. Let it be recorded you have shown contempt for this court and its proceedings and are therefore sentenced to die by quartering. Your limbs to be... The crowd rumbles. 
protests the harsh sentence. Your limbs... Calamel tries again. Brute! Yells someone in the crowd, and the rest grow unruly. Calamel stamps his cane. Please, my people. This man is a coward, a traitor, and thoroughly false. Like lead, he is corrupt. And the burnout of impurity must be completed before unification with the unlimited can begin. Now the crowd grumbles in confusion. Calamel seizes the lull and jeers to continue. Your limbs to be torn from your body by four strong horses and hung on the gates of the town as a deterrent to wastrels who would follow in your soon to be very wide footsteps. To the guards, he says, carry on. The sheriff's men tie my arms and legs to four iron bars. These they hitch to four stout Dale's ponies, attended by black hooded horse masters. You think he'll go to pieces? Alaric says to Bourne for my benefit. I don't know, says Bourne. It's a stretch. The two louts laugh in self-satisfaction as the horses pull and suspend me between them. I groan, and not just at the pun. One of the hooded horse masters checks all the chains to ensure their strength. Do I smell perfume? The duke raises his hand. Horse masters, ready your beasts. The horse masters raise their whips. The crowd grows restless, conflicted, and Timony jeers at me. Tear the animal apart. Hell hath no fury like a harpy in metal knickers. The duke gives the signal. The horse masters crack their whips, and the horses charge ahead. There's a strong tug in my legs and right arm, but it's not muscle and sinew that part company. Those three chains suddenly snap in two, a link on each weakened by some sort of corrosive. The leader of the fourth horse, the one who checked the chains, leaps onto its back and drags me behind, my left hand still connected to the harness. I struggle and twist as we bump along the cobblestones. Only my leather coat saves me from unreasonable bruising. I crane to see who the rider is. She looks back and I recognize Galena in disguise. What? I hear Calamel shout. She rides towards the castle gate with me in tow. Stop him! Yells Bismuth. His voice sounds like he's trapped down a well. Some guards move to intercept, but Galena rides them down. She splashes the liquid on the rope holding the portcullis. It hisses and breaks. The portcullis drops, just misses me, and cuts off any pursuit. We're out and into the town. Gauntlet! Calamel rages after us as the crowd erupts into cheers and applause. Yes! Yes! I hear Cadmia shouting. She throws her arms around Warren. He shrugs her off, annoyed. Chaos on the Duke's balcony. They're getting away, says Saltpeter to Railgar. What are you going to do? We were expecting this, says Railgar to Calamel. A plan is in place. What? Says Antimony to no one in particular. Come with me, my lord, says Railgar, and leads Calamel from the scene. It's the maid, I'm sure of it. Saltpeter turns to Bismuth. Find them. Gauntlet you can kill, but bring the girl to me. Huh, <laughs> Bismuth grunts. Outside the castle gates, Glena stops the horse long enough for me to free my wrist and gather myself. Get on, she urges. I jump on behind her and we ride out of the city together. We race through the forest trees. Think about the English countryside. There's enough hillocks, dales, boulders, and oak trees to hide an army. It's not like in the desert, where you can see fate a mile off. An enemy could be just behind the next ridge and I'd never know it. Finally, Galena slows the horse as it becomes obvious we've lost our pursuers. What was that stuff? I ask Galena. Aqua Regia, she tells me. King's water. Combination of aqua fortis, vitriol, and salt. Not a universal solvent, but it's close. You put it on the chains? I ask. Hmm. Neat trick, I say. How'd you get to be a guard? I put some on him, too. His foot, she clarifies in response to my look. Guess I owe you one, says I. What's your plan now? Get you to the Beverly Minster, says Galena. She referred to the sanctuary town on Calamel's border, where a criminal in fear of his life could escape. Whether as an accused murderer or political refugee, I suppose I qualified. Once you're past the sanctuary stones, I'll return, she continued. With luck, before I'm missed... Stay off the road, I say. 
It's slower, but if we're patient, we may yet slip the noose. She rides off the road, into the tangled forest outside of town, headed for the border. I tell her to canter halfway down the crest so no one below can spot our silhouette against the sky. The horse's hooves, cut into the uneven ground like a roan mountain goat, slip, but maintain their connection. The saddle heaves and chafes my thighs. It's too long since I've been astride a mount, but I can't complain. It could have been much worse than Saddleburn. We're getting close, she tells me. Closer than you think, I say, and slip a sponge from my coat pocket. I crush it over her mouth, and Helena passes out almost instantly. I light a campfire in a nearby cave and wait for her to come to. I'm not through with her yet. When she wakes and discovers herself bound, a look of fear crosses her face. I hate to see a woman terrified. I adjust the horse's saddle. What was that? Glane asks me. Mixture of opium and hemlock, I say. Brought a bit of alchemy back from the east myself. But we have to get to the sanctuary stones, she says. I may cross those stones tonight, I tell her. But I'm not sure you will. I cross the cave floor and squat beside her. I appreciate the rescue, so I'll tell it to you straight. His last words. It was the head. You were trying to create a brazen head at the smithy with Marcus's help. Her eyes go wide. The two of you were lovers, I continue. But then Antimony got her hooks in him. You couldn't kill her, so you altered the final instructions for the head to make it explode. Firelight dances on the cave wall. Shadows play in the soot. I can see it as if it's happening now. Glena leaves Marcus at the workbench. Tears in her eyes. The brazen head's a clockwork skull with thermostats full of caustic chemicals. She puts her hood on, runs out the door, and... The night you bumped into me, you were beating it out of there before he completed them, I say. That about right? Galena doesn't deny it. He saw I wasn't going to let it go, and concocted the story to pin it on the church. I press on. Only natural. How long have you suspected? She asks, her voice small. I was getting there already, but the tryst in the laboratory was telling. I flatter myself I'm worth fighting over, but there was more to it than that. It was payback. Should have known, she says. Duke said you grew up in a convent, I continue. French one, probably, explains your perfume, your cooking, and how you knew Tyronean notes, among other things. I could tell he recognized your handwriting. Oh, she says. You lied about the Michaelmas confession. And then there was the withered rose at the funeral. I barely remember the scene I'd made on the gravestone, but I remember her holding the dead flower. Only it wasn't just any dead flower. I show her the pocket reference book. Jabir says black rose is a hermetic symbol for disaster, arguments, ended love, and death, says I. I only need to know one more thing. Why? I couldn't keep her away from him, her voice breaks. To ensure the secrecy of our work, He was always back and forth to the castle, another of his regular clients, and she couldn't help but notice him. You know what she's like. Still, says I, a maidservant competing that hard with a noble lady, takes guts. You can't love if you're not jealous, says Galena. You're a philosopher, says I, but you can't turn lead into gold. That's not entirely true, but the forces required are almost unimaginable, she says. When we figured out how, Marcus was going to buy my contract from the Duke. Maybe I still will someday. We're all looking to be more than we are. No matter what it takes, I ask her. Duke Clissold won't last forever, she says. Someone has to continue his work. And you can't do it without antimony, I nod, understanding. You didn't want to lose your position. I live in a mansion full of beauty I can't possess, she says her voice more hollow than I'd have thought possible. I work with borrowed tools, borrowed ideas. She had clothes, money, men, much as she could want. Marcus was the only thing in my world that was special, that was mine, until she tempted him, polluted him right in front of me. She took him for her amusement, like she didn't even care I existed. That explained the look when she saw the two of us in Antimony's boudoir. She'd come upon Marcus and Antimony there, too, involved on the bed. I doubt they even noticed her. She leans back against the wall of the cave and cries. I'd be damned if I was going to share him with her, she continued. 
Was I supposed to wait until she finished with him? Take him back and accept my master's privilege? She wipes her tears with the sleeve of her robe, bound wrists together, her face grim and set. Marcus was my first love. Can you even imagine what that kind of betrayal is like? Nothing I can do to her will make up for what she took from me. I knew a girl once, I told her, daughter of my feudal lord. Sort of girl you'd turn pale in her presence. I was set to marry her. We were betrothed and everything. But I was vexed with too much passion, as they say. My lord went on crusade. He asked for my service, and in a bid for glory and status, I went along with it. It started out with a noble idea, but like so many things, it just turned into another opportunity for bloody-mindedness and horror. And the bird? Asks Kalena. Well, nothing voids a betrothal like deserting crusade. She flew when the deal went south. Life's a broken promise, honey. I'm living proof. Kalena looks up at me. I wanted to kill Antimony too, but I was selfish, afraid. What you did, standing up to your lord, being cast out, took real courage, she says. Courage I wish I had. Nobody's perfect! A pewter tankard booms from behind. Glena and I whip around to see the Black Knight and his crew arrayed across the mouth of the cave, crossbows ready. Just ask my boss. Bismuth advances towards us. He was real interested in those notes you showed him. Said you knew how to make a brazen head. Whatever that is. Sent me to get it, even if I have to cut it off. 